All right. <clears throat> Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, we're glad you're here. I uh, have a YouTube channel. The name of the channel is Patrick Gray, and I invite you to subscribe. I would be happy for you to subscribe. We're, I am working on a heavy lift drone project, hoping to <clears throat> show a way that a really actual functioning heavy lift drone could be created. We are looking at the Bodie Island Lighthouse <clears throat> in Nags Head, North Carolina. They actually moved this. That was pretty interesting. All right, and uh, <clears throat> I tend to want to build So again, uh, <clears throat> I tend to want to build <clears throat> what I'm talking about in a sequential fashion, part by part, starting at the foundation and working up through the basement and the first floor and the second floor and the roof and having an entire structure there for everyone to look at. But my friends tell me I should start out with my conclusion because people want to know what I'm talking about and they can evaluate the point I'm trying to make and decide if they want to watch the video and if they're watching the video they will understand where I'm going with it so I will start out with the conclusion I will be presenting this a lot of this to you through the use of a Corel draw graphics file that contains a lot of what I'm talking about there is math involved and I don't mind math and I don't mind you following the video and <clears throat> writing down notes but that can get a little old I took this entire CorelDRAW graphics file and converted it into a PDF file it's a 60 megabyte PDF file and I placed that PDF file on my website there's a page on my website on the topic of the heavy lift drone I tend to put my heavy lift drone work there on that page and as I make more work I just add it to the page so the top of the page is the most recent work and the bottom of the page is the oldest work but I'll show you this once I get going here I'll show you how you can navigate to that page and navigate to the PDF and you can download it and then you will have the PDF on your own computer and that way when I'm doing all this math and calculations you can just follow along you don't have to try to keep up with it and write it down because it's all in the PDF file I, and so it's loading here we are at my website pistonrobot.com I did a, a lot of discussion about a robot, but I also discussed things not related to a robot. This is part of the ankle of this foot. These images are created in Keyshot, a rendering program, and I just think they're pretty. So I put them on my website. Hello to everybody, how are you? Um, discussions about a piston robot then we go to discussions that are not about a piston robot and I have a variety of things that I talk about this I think is the left hip of the robot and all sorts of stuff that was intriguing to me I write about down this list is the heavy lift drone Uh, this was a sequence of walking steps that I did with the robot. And I just like, I like these feet. Um, and here's the introduction. We're talking about modifying an actual airplane so it can be a drone. And so we're at the piston robot discussions, not about a piston robot, heavy lift drone. And there it is. If you click on this, it downloads the PDF that runs this entire conversation so I just thought you just click on that and it downloads and there you go 
And so here we are on page one of the uh, Corel Draw document. It's 348 megabytes, and Adobe Acrobat got it down to 60 megabytes. I don't know how Adobe Acrobat did that, but it did. And I've had a little bit of trouble getting this page to stay in the middle of the screen. I don't use... Corel draw that often but it's a great program for writing stuff down but there's the whole page and I'm going to ex expand the size of it in a minute um, again the plane that we're talking or the drone that we're talking about um, I mean I will make a definition that I just made up because in the world of drones this is all going to become important and eventually they'll have a word for it that everyone agrees with. I have a phrase I call drone flying. Drone flying is when the item is flying around, it's a heavier than air object and it is up in the air. And the reason it is up in the air and stable and not crashing is because the propellers of the drone create enough lift that they overcome the weight of the drone and it goes up in the air. And so when it's flying around on its propellers, I call that drone flying. And if it has wings and has fixed wings, that is that they don't really move with respect to the uh, structure, then if the structure generates horizontal airspeed, the wings will create lift and they can create enough lift to hold the drone up in the air and with that point it becomes fixed wing flying so you can put the drone equipment on an airplane and when it's going straight up in the air it is drone flying and when it's flying along with a horizontal airspeed and the lift from the wings is enough to hold it up then that is fixed wing flying and all of those are phrases that i just made up but they become important because everything gets confusing so the plane i wanted to use a plane for safety reasons i'm going to get into a conversation on that uh, but also this plane is solid it already exists nobody has to invent it it was designed as a bush plane a unimproved airfield primitive wilderness cargo plane to move cargo around human beings also but mostly cargo and the uh, plane itself weighs 3,000 pounds the VTOL equipment adds 1,100 pounds for a weight of 4,100 pounds the payload consists of fuel payload and non-fuel payload the non-fuel payload consists of human beings and non-human being payload the total payload is 1,600 pounds, giving a takeoff weight from all sources of 5,700 pounds. The payload is 1,600 pounds. The payload is divided between fuel and non-fuel. So that's how this works. And what we are going to show by math is that the drone... And of course, I'm going to call it a drone. It's an airplane, but it's a drone because it's flying on its propellers. The drone was at zero altitude and zero vertical velocity. It also had zero horizontal velocity. And it went uh, to an altitude of 107 feet up in the air at 17 feet per second squared. That was the acceleration it had while doing that. The... Um, Total vertical flight activity, it was 12.6 seconds of accelerated vertical flying that got it to 17 feet per second. The vertical climbing velocity of the plane based on its manual is set at 17 feet per second. So we're not going to accelerate it faster than 17 feet per second. So it did 12.6 seconds until it got to 17 feet per second and then it backed down on the power of the uh, propellers so that instead of accelerating, it's just sitting at 17 feet per second. And so it continues upward for 25 more seconds at 17 feet per second. Uh, it will rise up 
uh, the additional 25 seconds at 17 feet per second gives it a total in increase in height from the ground of 107 feet plus 425 feet. So it's now 532 feet in the air in altitude, and this took 37.6 seconds. The uh, this, I always forget. Here you go. Let me go this way. The fuel used to get the, the drone is powered by two of the Rolls-Royce CTS-800 turbo shaft jet engines uh, if you work out their uh, sfc is what is called specific fuel consumption which is the number of pounds of fuel burned per hour per horsepower so um if you calculate that all out um it's and the horsepower that we're using to do this times two engine is 0.217 pounds of fuel per second times the 12 seconds it was accelerating and then a point it needs less fuel when it's not accelerating upward so it's 0.18 few pounds of fuel per second for 25 seconds so that it got to uh 532 feet in the air using up 4.5 pounds of fuel and that's the whole 5700 pound device at that point, it's 532 feet in the air. It has no further vertical velocity. It has Well, it has a vertical velocity of 17 feet per second, and it has no horizontal velocity. And so now it's going to add... Did it again? It's going to add horizontal thrust to increase its horizontal velocity, the airspeed. The activity of it doing that is it traveled... Uh, the, I broke down the horizontal tra travel into sections, and all of that's covered in the math. It was a section that took 327 feet to get it to 30 miles per hour. It was another section of 182 feet to get it to 40 miles an hour, and another section of 197 feet that got it to 60 miles an hour of horizontal airspeed. So it moved 706 feet horizontally at that point. The stall speed of this plane is 60 miles an hour. So once it's at 60 miles per hour, the lift from the wings is equal to the weight. So it is now holding itself up with its wings and does not need vertical thrust from the propellers. Uh, the time for this uh, drone to do this was um, each of these distances took a certain amount of time. 14 seconds plus 3 seconds plus 2 seconds is 21 seconds. So it took... Um, 37.6 seconds to go up in the air to 532 feet. Then it went horizontally 706 feet from a altitude of 532 feet with no horizontal airspeed to an altitude is slightly less altitude of, I don't remember what it is, like 480 feet of altitude and it's now traveling at 60 miles per hour horizontally and that took 21 seconds so the two jet engines can make a lot of horsepower the horsepower needed is 850 horsepower per engine 1701 horsepower total is being used the 17 and 1 horsepower times 0 0.46 pounds of fuel per horsepower per hour you divide that by 3,600 seconds in an hour, you get a fuel use rate of 0 0.21 pounds of fuel per second. Total vertical flying time, 37.6 seconds. Again, it used this many pounds of fuel per second when it was accelerating upward, and it uses this many pounds of fuel per second when it's just going up. It's not accelerating. 4.5 pounds of fuel got it to 532 feet. Horizontal flying time, 21 seconds at 0 0.21 pounds of fuel per second is 4.44 pounds of fuel. So that the de Havilland DHC-2 weighing 3,000 pounds for the plane, 1,100 pounds for the VTOL parts, 600 pounds of fuel as payload, 1,000 pounds of fuel as non-fuel payload. Non-fuel payload consists of human beings plus non-human beings. So if you had two 200-pound human beings in there, then that would be 400 pounds of non-fuel payload that is human beings, which means it could lift up 600 pounds of payload that is not human beings. It was at zero altitude and zero horizontal airspeed, and it changed its status to being, there's what it did, 
See, it loses a, when it when it when it starts out in the air and begins horizontal flying. It goes down some, and then it comes back up again once it gets up to speed. So, it lost 85 feet, went to 437 feet, and now flying at 60 miles per hour. And it's in stable horizontal flight. The activity of doing all of this used up 8.94 pounds of fuel. And well, that's and so it's got. 581 pounds of fuel left to just fly around up there and it can fly at 125 miles an hour and it only needs 136 pounds of fuel per hour to do that all of that is in the math and i'm going to show it to you but this is the conclusion so we thought we would start with the conclusion and then i'm going to show you how we established that at least by math all of this is true all right, and we're now back at the beginning, and we'll start this video with a story. We are in a program called SketchUp Pro. Trimble supplies it, so that's what we're in. I've done some drawings in that. And at this point, this is just a field. Let's see here. We can look at... We'll set this, the distance is equal to feet. So this little building here is 703 feet from this. This is, I think you can see, this is sort of a ditch with a rock wall or some sort of a wall there. And we can turn this around and you can see in this building, I believe, um, Yeah, inside the building, looks like it's got a floor, it's got two windows, three windows upstairs, a door, and two windows downstairs, and this building is sitting on a road, and it's looking out over this field, and we're like saying to ourselves, so what, who cares, so Maybe we need to look around a little better and we ease ourselves down towards this rock wall. The building is sort of looking at these rocks like this. There they are. And again, we continue to say, who cares? But as we swing around, oh, oh, look at this. What is going on here? Now, I use little mannequins because it's hard to draw a human being. So these are six feet tall. They're not dead and they're not wounded and they're not injured. What they're doing is hiding behind these rocks because this was a military patrol. This guy is particularly nervous. But they're all maintaining themselves in a condition where they are protected by the rocks. They were on patrol and they were cutting across this field because they do that. They left all their heavy gear over here somewhere and were cutting across to check on something over there and to look down at this road as they've done many, many times before. And this time they all ran into a group of soldier, enemy soldiers in this building that are shooting at them. And they're like, uh-oh. And they have called their base the name of the bases is based on geographic names so the name of this base that they're assigned to is greenville base and they call greenville base communications explaining what's going on that they're very nervous greenville base communications realized this was a big deal and got the executive officer and he came and as soon as he heard it he ran over to the commanding officers office handed the radio to the commanding officer as this was being briefed to the commanding officer and the executive officer what was going on and here is the conversation from the commanding officer he's speaking to whoever's running this one of these this sergeant here and said we understand your situation it's really bad and you are 10 miles from our base. 
the road that gets you there is winding and narrow and poorly maintained, we are, of course, putting together a rescue party for you. It's going to be an hour or so before we can get there. We've called Central Command. They do have aircraft availability for rescue and help, but they need to be brought out onto the airfield and the engine started and getting them ready and getting the pilots there. They have some airplanes that are in the air, but they're busy doing something else. Central Command has explained to us that they could probably give us some help in an hour and a half or so, maybe. And as your commanding officer, I just want you to know, as we listen to your situation, it is really bleak, and you guys are in serious trouble. It's hard to be optimistic. We do want you to know that we have checked the medical records, the medical department, and they have your records and your next of kin documentation and significant other and we've looked at all of those records, and they're clear and easy to read. So we want you to know for sure you can have the reassurance of knowing that we are going to be able to notify your next of kin and tell them what happened to you to create this terrible tragedy we are predicting. And we here at the base want you to know that we are absolutely 100% sympathetic sad and upset that you're not going to make it and we're being optimistic when we of course think you might make it but you have gotten yourselves into a terrible mess and we're sorry we will continue to try to get there and help you out so there you have it now that's one conversation just let that sink in <clears throat> And we'll now go to another version of this. It's a second conversation. And it goes like this. Same setup. They're in trouble. They're being fired upon at a distance of 700 feet from a lot of enemy soldiers in this building. And they're stuck behind this rock wall because they left all their stuff over here other than their weapons and uh, whatever ammunition is on their belt. And the executive officer has run into the commanding officer's office and handed him the radio and said to him, what is going on? And the commanding officer gets on the radio to, I think we decided this is the sergeant that's running this. And he says, okay, hello, this is your commanding officer. I'm glad to speak to you. We understand your situation. As you know, I'm the commanding officer of uh, Greenville Base. It's my policy whenever my people my soldiers go outside the perimeter of this base i require and demand that my aviation combat group fuel up all of my drones all three of them they put a full load of fuel in them they put a full load of their ammunition and weapons in them they also run the pre-flight sequence and anything that comes up as a problem on the pre-flight sequence, they are required to get that fixed and get them ready. So the drones are ready to go. The only thing necessary to get them in the air is to start the engine and do it. Once the engine is started, it needs to run for two or three minutes to get the oil warmed up and circulating, and then it's ready to take off. When it takes off, it can get the drone flying in stable horizontal flight over a period of one minute. You are 10 miles from here. It flies at 2 miles per minute, so those drones will reach you in 5 minutes. As you know, as your commanding officer, everybody knows me. I talk a lot. I've been talking. I think a minute or two has gone by. So uh, I should tell you, as soon as the executive officer heard this, he ordered that they go ahead and bring number one drone out and start the engines. As soon as I heard this, I gave the order to launch. So it's in the air. The other two are ready and waiting. <clears throat> and the one in the air has already been flying. I bet a couple of minutes have gone by. So it's three minutes from arriving at where you are. I am going to hand the radio back to the executive officer. And I'm going to sprint over to the combat air operations facility and monitor this. That drone has in it 12 of the smart mortars. And in the next three or four minutes, those enemy soldiers who are trying to hurt you, 
in this building over here, those enemy soldiers are going to wish that they had not bothered to mess around with the American soldiers. And that is the second conversation. Now I can, I want, I have, I think I should extend this conversation to tell more about it. I have a little bit of some nervousness that people would find that boring. So the f more of the conversation about that operation to save them, I'm gonna put at the end of the video. So <clears throat> if that doesn't interest you, then you don't have to listen to it. I will tell you, I have been involved in a situation where lethal items were available that could have had a lethal and fatal outcome for me. I was exposed to that for a while. I have not been in a situation where people are shooting at me with guns, and I have not been the commander of troops who are in combat where people are shooting at them. I've had to tell people sad news. <clears throat> I've never had to tell a bunch of troops that we care for them and we'd like to take care of them, but we think they're not going to make it. I've not done that. But I can use intuition, and my intuition is it's hard for me to believe there's a combat commander who would say, no, I, I don't mind conversation number one. That's fine. This happens, you know. I think all of the commanders that are out there would say, what? I would much, much rather do conversation number two. And if the U.S. military had a drone that could do what you're talking about and offered me three of them, particularly if they said they're under your control, they're at your base, you don't have to ask anybody to use them, and they've got weapons on board, my only question would be, I know you told me I get three drones and 100 of the smart mortars, but could I have five drones and 400 of the smart mortars? That's what I think the commanding officers would say. And I think by math, this drone is feasible. And I'm talking about a military drone. I'm not talking about a civilian drone. That's another topic for other people. I just want these people not to get hurt. And I want these enemy to know that the Americans have this so that these enemy in the future will say, eh, well, uh, let's not start shooting at American soldiers because they have that drone thing, and it turns out really bad when we do that. <clears throat> and I'll tell you a little bit of information about the drone and the configuration of it and what the weapons are. I know that doesn't have much to do. I wanted this video to be a video where I established that the drone really could get itself off the ground and fly. But it seems reasonable to me to know why are we even bothering to think about this, much less create it. And so that's why we're talking about the drone first. All right, and you can see here that we're on page 12, and we're beginning to actually show numbers. <clears throat> as, we, as I was making the YouTube video for this, it became clear that the YouTube is simply going to be too long to be one giant YouTube video. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do is break the video down into probably four different videos and as we're going I thought I was going to make you know part seven but it looks like I'm going to make part seven eight nine and ten but hey that's how it goes and so I'm going to start working on breaking the video to a little bit shorter segments but it doesn't mean anything. It just means when you're done with part seven, if you're interested and want to know more, go to part eight. And at some point, we're going to get to numerical calculations that show this drone should be able to get up into the air. I just felt like it didn't make any sense to go directly to numerical calculations without first showing why it's 
reasonable to try to make this drone because I think it's going to be useful and helpful. So there you go.